probably if we get down to that level, we don't exist. <laughs> We're just a little frequency that just passed by, and it had just happened to keep, uh, you know, reverberating through space for a little moment. Because again, our moment is very short. So, you know, from the Earth perspective, we might be just a sound. That was Monica. That was, you know. <laughs> and, um, and again, it's amazing because, um, yeah, this inside out and this outside in, even that, it's a point of paradox. Welcome to The Sounds of Sand, presented by Science and Non-Duality. My name is Michael Riley McDermott. Today we explore plant consciousness, singing plants, listening plants, and an expansion of the concept of non-duality to include plant life on our planet. My guest today is Monica Galliano. She's a research associate professor in evolutionary ecology and a former fellow of the Australian Research Council. She is currently based at Southern Cross University, where she directs the Biological Intelligence Lab funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. And she's pioneered a brand new research field of plant bioacoustics. For the first time, she's experimentally demonstrated that plants emit their own voices and that plants detect and respond to the sound of their environments. Basically, plants are listening. And her work has extended the concept of cognition, including perception, learning processes, and memory to plants. And her brilliant book, which we discuss quite a bit in this episode, is called Thus Spoke the Plant. And I highly recommend this mind-expanding, beautiful work. And so let's get into it today on The Sounds of Sand, presented by Science and Non-Duality. Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. All right, welcome, Monica, to Sounds of Sand. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Michael. <laughs> so before we get into the specifics of your uh, amazing and expansive work, I wanted to ask about your relationship to revolution and if that's um, been a recurring theme in your life because of much of your work and uh, seems very revolutionary to me in the science world, but also in, in just worlds of consciousness and spirituality, too. Um, I wonder if um, revolution is a word that others use to describe someone else's work rather than... Right. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm just doing what I'm doing. So uh, mm -hmm. I try to do the best that I can to to promote something or to contribute something that is, um, you know, it's for the, the common good, the greater good. And, uh, and I think anything that does that could be defined as revolutionary, but, um, yeah, I wouldn't know. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> but I if you that perceive it that way, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah. I just sense a lot of, of courage and integrity in, in, the work that you present, because obviously there's um, systems and science and society and the way that our world functions that, you know, want us to stay in our lane, as we say, you know, but to go out of that mm -hmm. lane, it takes, it takes bravery. So, you know, that, that's why I feel like your work is revolutionary. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, sometimes, you know, we assume when we look at other people that they're being brave Mm -hmm. And uh, I know for sure for myself that um, in most cases is actually there is not really a choice. I mean, there are always choices, but there is one choice that is the, the obvious one that you should be taking if you're really wanting to be alive and, and really living your experience. 
And then there are all the other choices. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So, you know, there is always one that learns more than others, that has got these shiny sparkles around it. And, mm-hmm. yeah, and if you're like me, you just, um, you can't help it. So then it looks like, oh, she's being courageous, but actually maybe it was more stupidity than anything else. <laughs> so I, I hear you on that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And so in preparing for this talk, you know, I read your book, Thus Spoke the Plant, and I've um, seen a lot of your videos over the years and the beautiful documentary Aware, which um, we actually featured on the SAN website at some point last year. And your book for me um, felt like a psychedelic experience just reading it. Like I couldn't believe what I was reading at, at certain points. And I was like, okay, I just have to surrender and go with the flow, you know, like, like, one has in a psychedelic experience. If you resist it, you know, things can come up. You just have to trust and and just let it happen. And (laughs) that's the way I felt with your book. And one of the most psychedelic, for lack of a better word, um, resonances I took from your book was not so much that the plants are making sounds, but that plants are potentially listening. And then I just look out my window and I see, you know, fields of, of, of grass and trees and just be like all of that, you know, all of that 80% of our planet is listening. And just what are the ramifications of that to know that everything is listening? Hmm. Well, uh, you said 80%. Why not a hundred percent? I I would say the entire thing is a listening instrument is, uh, and, um, I'm actually, at the moment, I'm preparing for a talk that I need to give in the U.S. uh, in about a month time. And I'm starting to, you know, ponder ideas and what it is that I want to, what kind of ideas I want to play with and what kind of words I want to play with. And and I've been looking um, at the first ice age and uh, and how, yeah, how this planet uh, has been doing the ice age business you know (laughs) and now somehow it seems that the first one was really really bad i mean it took 300 million years for for something to happen again afterwards and we lost 90 percent of the of living so um, then i look at the subsequent ice ages and and they never became like they were they were severe obviously but they were never as bad as the first one and and I know that as uh, complex life emerged, the planet increased its ability to be stable, to mm. provide support for life to then to, to flourish. So there is this, obviously, I mean, this is almost the core of the Gaia theory, right? Mm-hmm. But there is this nagging thought and feeling that is like... Um, I cannot stop thinking that during those 300 million years after the first, or during the the first ice age, she, as the planet, Mm -hmm. um, went off for a nice big dream and um, just trying to work out, what am I going to do for my next experiment? That one was (laughs) terrible. I failed. (laughs) And being an experimentalist myself as a scientist, I understand the power of pilots and now uh, we trial so many times, so many versions before we get it right. Mm. And um, and I th- I don't know I can't I can't stop feeling that she's been trying and she's doing really well <laughs> of getting it right. And 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 now we are here for this experiment. And and I think you know this is almost like this is the one that is gonna get published. <laughs> Mm. This is the this is the one, you know, and um, and I feel that this listening, uh, it's uh, it's one of the core elements of of it working, and my my work with the plants involved a lot of listening, not just um, the physicality of listening to the to the emission, the acoustic emissions, so the but also listening without the ears, you know, like mm. without without the with the body but beyond the body and um and if i again i can't help it feeling that that was my pilot for the bigger work ahead which is about listening to her as this planetary system 
And um, so that would involve more than 100% of what's, uh, what's here around us. And yeah, so listening is a very interesting stance and, um, and I think is evolving itself as well. So the bear listening to music or listening to the sound is almost like, yeah, that's the basic. Okay, we start from there. Mm-hmm. And then there are so many more layers to it. And, and my ears are not even that well trained. <laughs> so... Yeah, I'm. Well, well, well very as you curious. said, li- listening is more than just the ears, you know. So, it's your your deep knowledge and your intuition and your body and all of these things are contributing to to what you're listening to and what. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and in a way, what you were saying before about you know, um, letting the experience just happen. Mm-hmm. Instead of like uh, reacting to whatever is emerging that is like, oh, it's nudging me this way, that way. And instead I like, kind of surrender into the fact, like, okay, I'm here and I'm going to let it happen and see what it's got to show me and teach me. I feel in a way that's, this is the same. This, the, the listening experience requires that of us to yeah. really allow it to, let me show you. You know, yeah. instead of like, I want to know, is like, no, let me show you. You don't know what you want to know. So let right. me show you. Yeah. And it's a very different posture. I think I said 80%. I, I think I just looked that up. I was like, what percentage of the planet is plants or plant life or living? Mm-hmm. And I, I found 80%, but I like um, that you reframe that as more than 100%. <laughs> That's right. Because <laughs> I think, too, it, it uh, you, you know, when you're talking about exploring ice ages and, and, and talking about, you know, Gaia going to sleep for 300 million years, these time spans are, you know, basically magic to us because they're so incomprehensibly long that it, it might That's as well right. be, it might as well be magic, <laughs> you know. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it, I find it really useful because, um, especially obviously in the situation that we are experiencing at the moment with the planetary situation. Um, you know, we have the perspective of what, like a few centuries if we're lucky, and even that, like, I don't know. I think most people can conceive maybe a, a 10 years, 20 years, yeah. then mm-hmm. beyond that becomes a bit blurry. And uh, <laughs> and uh, so to conceive a hundred or a couple of hundred years is already like amazing. We can imagine that. But beyond that, it's Im- unimaginable. And, uh, and to think that the earth went to, you know, I'm just going to turn around and go for a nice little sleep. I'm going to dream up something new. And that took 300 million years. It's like, what's that? So, but she's got a very long time. Yeah. And, uh, and putting that perspective, I think, you know, we have a lot to learn because she's been learning herself for a long time. Mm. Yeah. And I, I, I do appreciate your, um, your optimism and your hope that, you know, these different, uh, I don't know what you call it, but like re- rehearsals or beta versions of the software of planet earth. <laughs> and this is the one that's, that you, you think is going to continue this, this version of the, of the, um, ecosystem where some, you know, obviously it's always changing. So it's not like we're always going to have, you know, white polar bears and, you know, whatever, <laughs> worms that turn into butterflies, like, you know, in several million years, maybe there'll be different permutations of all of these things. But, um, yeah. Well, and even our own species, as we know, right. we've been through two ice ages, for sure. Mm-hmm. And uh, here in Australia, you know, Aboriginal Australians are, at the very least, 60,000 years old as a living culture. So we have definitely, as you know, as, as humanity, as we are now, we have actually been through an ice age and an extinction event before. Mm-hmm. And um, I think what I'm trying to contemplate on in the context of this talk that I need to prepare um, is like what was the special ingredient that we had available and connected with that seems to be missing or be misplaced Mm -hmm. right now and again I think for me I go back to listening and listening to the voices of others which are non-humans 
who have been here longer than us and who have, you know, they might have uh, wisdom and, um, and even uh, perspectives that we cannot even conceive of. And, um, and I've experienced it myself in the small, you know, in the small scale. Uh, I remember when I was trying to do the experiment about this, the associative learning in plants, and I had all my little ideas of how I was going to do it with the sunflowers, and I had all my design and set up, and of course you run the pilots, and it should work, and everything, the setup should work, and yet the plants are not doing anything. <laughs> And uh, so, of course, as the good scientist I am, I assume is the plant that doesn't know how to do this rather than I'm, I am the one doing it wrong. And, uh, and then I abandoned it. So that pilot was like, oh, okay, this didn't work. But then I guess the seed of the idea remains. And then I had to encounter a plant to give me almost like the keys to open those uh, notions and, uh, and then that experiment came out uh, truly as a collaboration. But obviously I was the one not ready to hear, even if I was given the information when I was trying the first time. And, uh, and so I feel, sometimes now I feel as if the work that I've done with the plants was the pilot for the big work that is going to come through that it might need to be done in relation to, um, yeah, we're going to collaborate with the earth and this experiment that she's making, uh, she's creating it with us as well. And everyone else is here, not just humans. But um, maybe we just need to be, you know, told a bit clearer what the role that we have in the picture. And uh, because let's face it, I mean, like we have spoken of like, okay, we cannot cut trees anymore. No, mm -hmm. the devastation is no longer possible, you know. Uh, it was never possible, but, you know, like really now there is no, I don't think there is no one that says like, oh, I didn't know about that. <laughs> oh, do, what, we have a climate problem. Oh, I didn't know about that. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, people could have still, you know, played ignorant. But I think now most people got, the, got it. And most yeah. people are suffering from the grief of realizing, oh, wow, we are really in a, in a big mess. Yeah. And yet... Um, you know, this is almost like part of the process and and it's part of the process of like failing the first uh, pilot so that we as the species, the human species can try again. And maybe at the time we were not ready to hear, but we have also evolved with everything else in this system. And the earth has uh, its own way to stabilize complexity. And the more complexity, the more stabilizing she becomes. And um, and so I think that we are like, w in a way, we are losing a lot of species and so decreasing the complexity of this system. But in a, at the same taken, at the same side, we are actually increasing the complexity of the problem. And um, and I'm hoping that she's got some very genius ideas uh, <laughs> that we are now ready to hear, which we cannot conceive of. They're not even present yet but the seed was planted a long time ago and um, yeah I don't know maybe I'm totally delusional too <laughs> I don't think so and I love that what you're talking or at some point um, earlier when you were speaking you, you talked about sort of uncovering something that was hidden or something that was covered over and that reminds me of you know so much of spiritual practice of meditation it's like you're not trying to invent some new way of being or, you know, come up some new innovative state of mind, all you're doing is allowing the thoughts and the stories to settle down. And then what's underneath is this natural radiant sense of awareness. And that's, that's the, that becomes the teacher. And it sounds like that's what we need. You know, it's these, you know, there, it's not not revolutionary to think about, but you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, indigenous wisdom and the sciences of how our species survived for these, you know, millions and millions of years was through the science and ancient knowledge that's um, it's been covered over, but it's not lost. You know, there's still mm -hmm. people here that know about it and and can teach us, and we can integrate it into our modern 
you know, society with 8 billion people and growing on the planet. That's right. And also, you know, um, we are losing a lot of these knowledge keepers mm -hmm. and wisdom keepers. And, um, but, and of course, that's really sad because um, it's much easier. You know, we're humans, so it's much easier to transfer the information human to human. But, um, but I agree, the knowledge is not lost anyway. Even when these knowledge keepers are lost or gone or passed over, the knowledge still remains with her. It was always with her and it will remain with her. It's just that it's missing out the key, the easy way of getting access to it by sitting in a circle and listening to the story that an elder is going to share. Uh, but we can still sit in a circle and listening to the story that the quintessential elder has to share. Mm -hmm. And that's this planet itself. So, um, yeah, for me, this, uh, and this is really, I've always felt this way, but it's coming really strongly since I engage with this material on the, on the deep time and the ice ages and just really feeling her as this living agent that is part of this amazing, incredible revolution that we are in the middle of. And um, yeah, I, I think it's actually, I'm very grateful that I'm alive now, despite the despair and the grief, of course. In reading your book, uh, another thing, I love science fiction, and what I was reading was so fantastical. I was like, this is almost like a science fiction book, but it's real. <laughs> it's like it's something that you, mm -hmm. you actually experienced. And um, I wonder, have you ever seen the movie Arrival? Do you know that film? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just for people that haven't seen it, the, the, the protagonist is a, is a communication language expert, and aliens come to earth and she, you know, the government hires her to say, can you figure out what these aliens are trying to say to us? And uh, in the process of learning their language, her, her actual consciousness becomes changed and her perception of time becomes changed. Um, and so I was wondering if, if something similar, do you feel something similar has happened to you in listening and communing with the plants in such a deep way? I don't think that you can remain you can remain what you wear uh, with any interaction. I mean, like we do that to each other all the time, right? We, by encountering each other, we change each other. And so, um, yeah, these encounters are not different. For me, it didn't feel any different than any other encounter. And in that way, I'm really trying to normalize this in the sense that it, I know it sounds fantastical. And it, it, my dad said to me, if it wasn't that it was you and it was someone else that I didn't know that wrote these or says, say these, I wouldn't believe it. And I said to him, like, probably I wouldn't believe it either. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, the, the experiences that we live through change us. And these are just... Um, really beautiful experiences and it just they are enriching because um, they really speak to that part of us uh, which sometimes uh, believes that we are this separate entity that you know it's floating isolate in isolation from everything else and to be somehow reminded by others who are so, so different from us, even biologically speaking, you know, different form, different functioning, different ways of being life. Uh, it just, yeah, it just reconnects some dots internally that I think are very useful <laughs> because they bring a, a feeling of, yeah, of belonging, I guess. Yeah, it, it, I guess it's, it's back to this theme of, of rediscovering an ancient part of us that was lost, this idea that there is no separation between us and plants. You know, we have, we've, in, in, we consume plants, you know, t you know, tea and tobacco and coffee and um, for medicine, we consume plants and they're, they're so much woven into 
who we are as a species. And so it, it, it sounds to me like you know, it, it was, again, just rediscovering an ancient, an ancient form of communication that's been somehow lost in the modern, modern times. Mm, I mean, you know, again, in the context of um, uh, the work that I'm looking at at the moment for the Ice Ages, is like, uh, fundamentally, we are a concoction between some archaean microbe and a bacteria who had some great ideas of, you know, paddling and playing together and, and making something new, which was, you know, complex life. And then, of course, we have all sorts of variation and we can debate about the details and everything. But fundamentally, here it is, you know, and we are that bacteria too. And we actually have them, you know, we are already a collective. We think of the individual and our society at the moment is very focused on the individual. But what is the individual? Who Who is me? You know, it's like the bacteria that are in my guts that allow me to be me, uh, less me than me. <laughs> uh, so, um, and of course, when you think of the consumption of another in case of food, and um, yeah, that's like you are bringing these others, whether they are animals, plants, constantly inside this envelope that uh, and in that process you are remaking the envelope and remaking the entire system over and over again every day uh, for most people three four times a day <laughs> depending mm -hmm. on how much you eat and uh and you know i only eat plants so i am probably more plant than anything else mm -hmm. because uh, that's the material the building blocks that literally make my body every day and um yeah, I think that if we were to stop and really ponder that in the morning when we get up, it's like, okay, this morning I'm, I'm, I'm made one more time of the sunlight that got translated into sugars, that got made into some cell in my hand. <laughs> um, that's crazy. It's like, like if that's not a full-on um, trippy, I don't know what mm -hmm. it is. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I, I, actually, I just read a, um, a quote from the comedian George Carlin um, that I, I won't remember the exact quote, but it's something about like how exactly trippy it is that, you know, every night we close our eyes and we lay completely still. And, you know, we have we go off into this imaginary dream world that we don't even realize is a dream world. And then eight hours later, the organism wakes up and it still remembers who it was before it went to sleep. Like that's science fiction. Like if, you know, if if we didn't have sleep in, as a uh, in animals and 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 other organisms, we would think that's the craziest story I've ever heard. <laughs> that that something that's, could do that's that. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the, I mean, I love to what you're talking about because you know, it's, uh, science and non-duality. It's like what you're describing is almost the ultimate form of non-duality. It's an, it's an expansion externally of non-duality of oneness, but it's also an expansion internally of saying that mm -hmm. this individual self that I think I am is not the case. You know, it's a, like you said, it's a democracy of, <laughs> of bacteria and experience and liquids and energies. And, you know, that's just our current model of it. You know, who knows how actually complex it is in there. You know, if you get down into the, uh, you know, electrons and quarks and all this sort of stuff. Probably if we get down to that level, we don't exist. Yeah. <laughs> We're just a little frequency that just passed by. And it just happened to keep, uh, you know, reverberating through space for a little moment. Because, mm -hmm. again, our moment is very short. So, you know, from the Earth perspective, we might be just a sound. Boop. That was Monica. That was, you know. and um, and again, it's amazing because um, yeah, this inside out and this outside in, even that, it's a point of paradox because you need to have out and in. Is like you need to have very concrete concept of what out actually is and what in actually is. But if you realize that you don't really know what in and out is. You have an experience that apparently tells you that 
you know, what's beyond this barrier that I feel is my skin, it's the outside. But, um, but I'm breathing and speaking and like, you know, as I'm wording and my sound is coming out, hair is coming in, it's like, so the, I'm, I'm totally permeable. Mm -hmm. And so where is my inside and my out? It's like, it's that again, it's madness. And so a good madness. And, yeah. and so again, it's the, the point of paradox, I think, is where life really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that there is no, you can't find the boundary between the inside and the outside. There is no boundary. So it doesn't, That's right. we can't actually say it. there is a separation, there is a non-duality there. Of, uh, and yet as, there is. The experience you have is very much like, uh, you know, and you know what it means when you, when you cut the boundary Mm -hmm. uh, you bleed and, and you know that that's no good. You are, you're bleeding out, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So it's like, that's not, that doesn't feel right. I'm, I'm losing myself. I'm losing blood. I'm losing myself. And yet, so th that's, that's exactly the paradox. It's like, um, can you hold those two together? Like the fact that you are an individual enclosed and contained as well as totally not, <laughs> totally right. open and permeable at all times. And uh, and both, although they look like paradoxical, they are they are both happening, and they're both true at the same time. It's beautiful. I was actually going to read an excerpt from your book, "Thus Spoke the Plant," which I think relates to this topic of the the emptiness, as you talk about in Buddhism, of the interconnectedness and the the complete perfection in that interconnectedness. And so the excerpt from your book is, this knowing comes from being empty, but emptiness does not reduce the plant to a passive, spiritless, and objectified materiality, but rather liberates her from the pursuit of fulfillment, already fulfilled in every moment always realized in her full potential. The plant is completely available to know her circumstances by listening deeply. For a human being to know this way is to be at least momentarily free from internal inconsistencies between attitude and actions. It means to be empty of socially indoctrinated belief systems that prescribe the boundaries of how we are expected to perceive and behave in a given situation and that justifies our own actions even when they are unwise and out of sorts with our internal emotional and moral intelligence wow <laughs> who wrote who that, wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, no, you're, I mean, there's so many passages in your book that are, for me, very deeply spiritual, um, the, the way that they resonate. It's like, they sound like, you know, some kind of ancient wisdom teaching. Um, did it feel that way when you were writing or did you, were you more, it sounds like you're a very modest person. So you're probably just like, ah, it's just words I'm writing. <laughs> No, I actually, I have to admit that I don't remember <laughs> mm -hmm. in the sense that um, I wrote and, uh, and while I was writing, it was the, it, it really felt like it wasn't just me, but it felt that that's why I called it a phytobiography. It mm -hmm. really felt that some of the material was uh, given to me to write because I'm the human that can touch the keyboard and it's got fingers to do that. <laughs> but, um, and, but it wasn't necessarily just me. Of course, it's filtered through the human that I am, but, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it felt like it was really a collaborative effort. And when the book was finished and I handed over, I never read any of it again. Well, that was it. I never read my book. So people keep telling me like, oh, you know, there is this beautiful quote and this other piece and this passage. And, and I, you know, as you were reading, I was listening as if it was someone else's. And, uh, and it feels nice to be that way because uh, it doesn't make me feel I, I, I don't have any 
need or feeling of attachment to it. It's not like, oh, those are my words. Right. <laughs> it's like, oh, who said that? Oh, that that's nice. <laughs> so it's kind of liberating, actually. Mm, that's beautiful. That's such a, a selfless perspective to have of the work, you know, and I think... I know you're a scientist, but to me, that's a sign of like a truly great artist, someone who's able to just put it out there. And it's like, now it's not mine. Now it's the world's and you can interpret it and be with it any way you want. I'm going to go work on the ice ages now. <laughs> that's right. And you know, the thing is like science is a form of art. Yeah. True science is. Mm. And um, that's why it makes me feel really sad when I look at the way in which science is done or it's the expected science, you know, the science that gets the grants and is expected to to be performed. Um, often that science doesn't really move us. The majority of that science doesn't do anything. And so why are we doing it? If it doesn't move us, why are we doing it? And it's very easy for us to focus on, you know, music or art and somehow we think of those practices like, oh, they're designed to move us. You know, that's their job. But, um, but shouldn't be any human endeavor that we are engaging with move us? Mm -hmm. And so if it doesn't move us, it's actually really failing for me. And, um, and in the same way as an artist, then, you know, you want to feel that movement yourself. And once it's done, you just want to share it because it's, uh, you know, it's so cool. Why don't you want, don't you want everyone else to feel it? And, uh, but then it's over and there is another movement. And so off you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so speaking of this sort of intersection of science and art, um, the first time I was introduced to your voice and your work was on another podcast called 20,000 Hertz. Um, and do you remember this interview or this? Um, I this don't, rem I don't remember vaguely, but it yeah. was a while ago. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was maybe four years ago or so. And, uh, actually my friend was on it. That's why I listened to it. This, uh, somebody I know who, who creates one of these devices that takes, um, the, um, you know, the, the electricity in plants and converts it into MIDI data to make music, um, and, uh, you know, it's nice sounding music. I've played with this device before I stayed at his house for a few months um, at one point. And they're fun. And I think that there can be a, a gateway into an, an expanded sense of consciousness involving plants. But then you came on. And when I heard your voice and what you're saying, it was such a breath of fresh air because it felt so authentic. And again, listening from this place of, of I don't know, you know, we're just going to listen to what the sounds of that plants are making and not try to force what plants have to say into this human shaped box that's easily consumable. That's right. I'm actually, um, I get emails and re like questions about these devices all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm so over it. Just like uh, I keep saying the same thing and I find it, um, Sad. That's, that would be the right word. Because, and I, I can elaborate on this, it's not just yeah. like random. Well, these devices are multimeters, basically. Mm -hmm. Detect the, the voltage changes, and uh, this is what your electrician does when he comes and checks, checks your, the electrical system of your house. Mm -hmm. So um, then... We add, and now these gadgets have been, you know, created, invented, nothing new, but, you know, like different shape and forms of the same. And, and they basically add onto these uh, multimeters, fundamentally, uh, a sound card that can, you know, pick those electrical signatures and translate them into, tra like, sonify them, basically. So translate them into a specific human selected predetermined note and of course is uh, as you pointed out perfectly is within a, a specific range which will make the sound come out first of all audible to us 
and then otherwise it will defeat the purpose <laughs> of a gadget. And then uh, audible is not enough. It needs to be pretty. It needs to sound somehow musical. It needs to sound something that we can recognize and it's familiar to us. Which if I plug you to that machine, you will also make this beautiful little music. And if right. I said to you, oh, hey, Michael, that is your singing voice. You will right. be, exactly, you'll be laughing and be like, yeah, that's funny, but it's not. And I know that. So how come that when we do that with plants or now even fungi, we can extrapolate and not see the, that there is a problem? That that is not the voice of a fungal network, is not the voice of a plant. That is an electrical signal, which pretty much anything that is alive has, because the spark of life is, uh, is not a trivial thing to say. It's like life is electrical or electric. And um, so how come that we have this dissonance? And I think... These gadgets, the original gadgets, were developed in the 60s, 70s, and I think maybe at that time they had a place because uh, there was a particular consciousness in humanity that was trying to really revolutionize some of the boundaries that we were holding. Now, those boundaries are gone. So it's almost like uh, these gadgets are not really serving us anymore. It's more like uh, we are adults and we still want to play with the little dolls or the little car that we had when we were three-year-old. It's like, it doesn't work. And to uh, expect that to do anything for our evolutionary conscious trajectory, I think is ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, uh, it doesn't. It only, to me, it only really... Uh, in a very strange, um, subversive way, it only um, perpetuates the very problem mm. of ignoring the voices of these others, uh, not making even the effort or pretending to want to listen to them, but mm. overimposing directly. This is colonialism 101, you know? Right, right. Overimposing our voice, our way, our vision, our experience onto another. And that, in that sense, it's sad because it's like, uh, yeah, it might be pretty on the surface, but come on, aren't we grown up enough and sophisticated enough and sapiens enough? to go a little bit deeper than just the, the banal surface of like, oh, isn't this pretty? The little plant is singing. It's like, no, she's not singing. Although even as I say, these plants do sing, mm -hmm. but not this way. Right. And there are, as we know, there are some very deep and non-trivial practices that have been developed. And there are really, you know, for me, there are technologies, methodologies, they have been developed and, and used and, and they require an effort from our part. So they're not this fat food, fast food, off the shelf kind of thing. No, you need to put the work. Uh, and then the plant will uh, encounter you. And if the plant choose to share, then you might hear her song. Mm. Not guaranteed. And that's why the not knowing, the unknown needs to be there. Because otherwise, it's almost like saying that with every relationship, with every encounter that we have, even amongst people, we have already decided what the other person needs to be for us. And when we do that, we know it's not very good. It's like we end up in very tragic uh, relationship and often they just come to a very horrible end. Because everyone wants to have the opportunity to express the self. And so why are we removing this opportunity from these others while at the, on, with the same breath we're saying like, oh, this is so, so that we can experience them and like, no, you're actually trivializing them and silencing them. And this is sad. Please, people, stop. <laughs> or, or don't ask me anymore because I don't want to comment on this ever again. It's like, it's, it, it's yeah, I just... Somehow I feel like um, it is so obvious to me that, that there is a problem. And I, I'm always ever surprised that the problem would not be so obvious for many other people. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, for... very strong on this. <laughs> no, no, I'm really happy that you uh, expressed yourself so fully on that because it's, uh, you know, I feel like on the that particular podcast that I heard, I felt like you were edited it very heavily to to just kind of give this gentle pointing in the other direction, but I sense there was a deeper um, themes, currents running under the how problematic it is to always, and it, you know, it's it's not just with the um, these, you know, plant to music things, but it's, it's all over our society. You know, it's Instagram filters, it's social media, it's all these things that put things into a box and say, this is you, isn't it? You know, this is your, I see how happy you are with your latte, you know? And it's like, th this is just problematic. And again, it's like you said, it's colonial. Totally. I think that the, the ingredient that is missing uh, with these approaches is uh, reverence. Mm, yeah. You know, like uh, the honoring of the other with reverence. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to know about, you know, if you want to know about Italian culture and you want to know how it works, you have to go and explore their food, uh, go and live in the country for a while, uh, see how you interact with people, the language, you know. You wouldn't just go and say, like, I'm really keen to learn everything that is about being Italian, but I want it English way <laughs> or German way or whatever other way. It just doesn't work. But that's what we're doing. Basically, we're saying, like, uh, I want to know about plants, but I want it my way. Mm -hmm. and, and in that moment, you already forfeit the, the relationship. And, um, and the sad thing about that is that actually the moment you go with reverence, which really means like you are allowing for whatever needs to happen to happen with no expectation, including then the other chooses not to turn up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't want to know you. It doesn't have to, you know? Right. So again, this imposition is like, oh, because I'm turning up, you must turn up. It's like, no, this is an open space. You go with reverence and, and you're, you know, presenting yourself open. And then if the other wants to encounter you, then it's their choice. It's, and it's consent, right? It's the idea of consent. That's right. And then if that is the kind of meeting that happens, then it's a totally different story. You know, it's, uh, to be really crude, but it's, like, uh, it's almost like rape and sexual abuse compared to a beautiful, uh, sensual and sexual experience with a loved one. Yeah, I've heard that. I, I've never um, um, had experience with ayahuasca, but I've heard that you shouldn't seek it out. You should wait for it to find you, the right circumstance to emerge where it's ready to, to meet with you. You know, it's not uh, like something you can just go to, into a dispensary and buy a bottle of and go back to your house and drink it. Like it needs to be... Although that's happening. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. You have this project called Resonant Earth, which I saw on your website, and I've heard you talk about um, briefly. But could you explain it more? Because I love that title, Resonant Earth, and what that project's about. Mm -hmm. uh, Resonant Earth is—it's um, a baby that hasn't hasn't quite come out yet. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it's got this very long gestation period, and sometimes <laughs> I get really frustrated with it. And every time I get to that place, I had to let it go. Okay. And I just did that like uh, the last six months last year. Uh, that's what I had to do. It was like, a, it was very clear. I, I was in meditation, in ceremony, walking with my dog everywhere. Every time I asked, the question was, the, the answer was always the same. It was like, you have to let it all go. The, forget about this project. You forget about this beautiful idea. Forget about it. And I was like, but I can't. I was like, well, you have to. So I had to thinking like, okay, so I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> and then of course, the moment you do that, it comes back in a new invented, in a new form. 
So the original uh, idea actually was given to me from uh, a deep retreat that I did in darkness. And a plant actually sent me to that. So the plant uh, in question was the cacao. And over the course of like a year almost, it kept giving me little details, but like snippets of something that of itself didn't make any sense whatsoever. And um, like 39, and then on another ceremony, I would see like uh, these, the beak of an eagle and the big eye of an eagle. That was it. And uh, like, and it kept like for almost a year, that's all I was getting, these bits and pieces. But at the same time, the plant kept saying like, pay attention, pay attention. And I was like, okay. And I could see that there was something about it that I needed to really trust that whatever was given was going to make sense, even if I didn't know anything. And then eventually when it did make sense, I ended up like 39 days in the darkness in Mexico. And during that experience, which of itself is a huge conversation, mm-hmm. I, um, yeah, I was given towards the end of the retreat, um, in the pitch black, I saw as if it was a film, you know, as like images and beautiful, clear, and, and I saw it done, you know, and, uh, and the name came with it. And it was like, this is Resonant Earth. This is what you need to do next. And I'm like, okay. And initially it looked like it was all about regeneration of the planet and using sound. And so in a very practical, and as plants often do with me, like very practical, you know, instructions, like, okay, off you go, you do that. But what was interesting at that time was that during that moment, it seems the everything, all of the experiences that I had all the way from when I was a child, all the way to that moment, um, they all, they were all important. So I was like, do you remember when you were three about this? And then do you remember these details? And every single detail got pulled together to just show me how, do you remember even when you were doing your, your PhD work and I was working as a, as a marine scientist, I was working with fish on the Great Barrier Reef, very privileged. <laughs> and, um, and the main work that I was doing was about the role of mums, so the parents, into preparing, in a way, the, the next generation for the future environment. And, of course, when, when I left the marine work to start with the plant work, I never really touched that stuff anymore until then. And then it was like, do you remember that? Well, you know. You know how that works, and you know that these effects, which we used to call the maternal effects, now they go under the epigenetic effect. At the time, it wasn't... It wasn't that easy, the conversation, but, um, yeah, the power of the role of mums, especially, but parents and even grandparents to shape in very adaptive way, the next generation, uh, was presented to me like, and you can do it with sound because sound is one of those, uh, signals that can capture the environment you know like you can use chemistry for example but you will have one aspect of the environment you know you can use the salinity of the water or the the amount of light but you can't capture everything while sound can you can literally create a container an an acoustic a sonic container of that place and um and so the idea was very simple and it was like a the environment the mums experience during the gestation of the baby will impact how those babies are going to do in later in life. And for most species, I would say all species, no matter animals, plants, whatever, that moment at the very beginning of life is super critical. That's when the highest mortality is. I mean, even for us humans, we know that our little babies, when they're premature, it's really, you know, dangerous time. So, so the, in the vision, it was like, you see, we need to become midwives and we need to support this transition because the environment is changing so rapidly. The moms are having to do a really hard job to try to adapt and, and also, 
shift and change their babies in a way that they will be ready for yet an environment that has already changed by the time they get there. So, but it's almost like by, by bridging these two generations, so the moment of mums and the moment of babies, so that we can transfer a little bit of the maternal environment still with the baby and carry them over. Um, it just came to me, it, it, uh, the feeling that I had was just like, wow, this is so, this is such a, this is women's business. This is such a feminine process. And literally it's about birth, it's about mothers, it's about midwives. But the entire thing was just like, wow, we're not going to interfere with the system. We are just going to support what the system is already doing and help it out to do it even better than it is already able to. And uh, which is what we do when we put our babies in incubators. We're just bridging the two worlds. And so then it came, you know, down to, okay, how do you do it? And, and how do you deploy it? And, how to, and these are all questions that I'm still tossing and turning because, uh, uh, you know, there are ideas of, you know, we need to build some incubators. And I have colleagues that I've been talking with about this, in building specific incubators that can like just the baby, the one that we use for humans, baby. And, and yeah, and transfer some of these propagules for plants or for animals across systems, especially those who create the foundation for ecosystems. So, you know, coral reefs and the benthic life creates life and creates the environment of the space where then fish come and live. So you don't start from the fish, you start from the bottom. And the same with plants. There are some plants, as we know, that create a foundation for then a forest to grow and flourish. So you would focus on those guys mm -hmm. and or ladies. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, so it's the combination of um, science and art, again, yeah. because it's like, and I have no idea if this is going to work. But I, what I saw as a vision was complete. And it was like, uh, I got to the end and I'm like in the dark. I'm pretty sure that from outside they could hear me giggling because I was just, I just felt like a mad woman, like giggling. So I, but this is so simple. Are you kidding me? This is it? <laughs> and it was like, yeah, that's it. And, um, and yet I was a fool because it's not simple at all. Otherwise I would have done it already. <laughs> and, um, and just now, literally, um, I'm arriving to the place, as we said at the beginning of this conversation, I'm arriving to the place of, okay, I, I have been collaborating with plants to do my science, and that was my training. And now I need to collaborate with the big mama to do the, the real deal. And so I'm still not sure how that is going to happen. But I know, for example, that um, even in a couple of weeks, I'll be going to the field and and the entire idea is to sit here in Australia, we, we call it country, which is the land. And so I'm going to be in the middle of nowhere and, uh, and I'll be just sitting on the land. And literally, I just want to sit, dream with her, listen deeply and be taught. How do we do this together? Because she needs my hands. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> she needs my hands. She probably needs some of my words. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I need her too. And so if we are to pull this off, I, I really, it really feels like to me, this is, can only happen as a collaboration. And, um, so I'm excited and I know that I will be not the only one because I can see the many ideas more than ever, it seems many ideas and many inspirations are popping up at the same time everywhere. And this used to happen, but not as much. Uh, at the moment, it feels to me that, you know, if I think of something, within a few weeks, there will be many other places that they're thinking the same. And it's like, okay. <laughs> so, um, so that's really amazing because it feels that if I sit on country for 10 days on my own, I know that me doing it means that others are about to do that too. And so it amplifies again. If if I am a frequency, it, um, my frequency is being amplified and is gonna be entering in resonance with others who can carry the same frequency. And so, um, resonant earth is the right 
name for this project because it is all about resonance. And as we know, resonance amplifies the signal and that's what we need. Mm, beautiful. Wow. That sounds like, uh, well, first you have a, you have a great collaborator. <laughs> with the I hear she does great, right. great work. So I think you're in good hands there. Um, and there's so many, um, uh, yeah, so many different things I would love to ask about this project, but I want to be mindful of your time and maybe um, I'll extend the invitation that we can we can speak again at some point and um, talk sure. more about Resonant Earth and your um, your research into the Ice Age and Deep Time, which is all really fascinating to me. But um, thank you for your time and your openness and everything that, that you have done and everything that you do uh, in collaboration with the plants. It's, it's beautiful work and I'm really honored to have... Uh, spent this hour in conversation with you thank you thank you so much yeah it was fun <laughs> and thank you for listening to the sounds of sand we invite you to explore more of our talks dialogues videos articles events and offerings through our website science and non-duality.com if you've enjoyed this conversation please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of sand content available exclusively to SAN members. And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify. And share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well.